Hello, welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester, I'm the Director of Public Programs, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's Hammer Forum on forced sterilization and other means of controlling the reproductive rights of women. This program is in conjunction with the screening of the Emmy-nominated documentary, No Mas Bebes, which we screened at the Hammer last week, and both public programs are part of our current exhibition of feminist Latina artists called Radical Women, Latin American Artists, 1960 to 1985. This exhibition opened in September, and there's been an absolutely extraordinary response, both in the, in the press and from visitors to the museum. A central theme in Radical Women is violence, especially violence against the female body under oppressive political regimes, which for me resonates strongly with the present political situation in the US when many of women's rights are being challenged. The exhibition includes the series Women Under Fire, made by Chicana artist Isabel Castro in 1980 when she learned of and investigated the co coerced sterilization of Mexican-American women in Los Angeles during the late 1960s and early 1970s. Her series deals with the inhumane treatment that Chicana women have endured and its psychological impact over generations. And I hope that if you haven't seen it yet, you'll come back to the museum and check it out. We are open today until five and every day except Mondays, a museum admission is free. We also have tons of other public programs related to the exhibition throughout the fall, including an incredible night of live music next Thursday night with the Latina-fronted bands Sotomayor and Sin Color. We have a panel discussion on Latina stories in contemporary American television on November 5th and a new documentary about the iconoclastic singer Shabella Gar Vargas on November 28th. Also every Thursday night, we're having invi we've invited scholars and artists to do a special kind of exhibition walkthrough of a highly personal and subjective nature. On this Thursday, we'll have artist Nao Bustamante, followed by Nicole Hebron next week, and then Artemisa Clark, Maricela Norte, Sandra de la Losa, and Raquel Gutierrez. The whole list is available um, in the Hammer calendar. So if you'd like to receive reminder emails about these, you can sign up on the email list in the lobby or on our website. Now on to today's panel. The Hammer Forum is a monthly series of public discussions about current social and political issues, and it's made possible with the generous support of Andy and Branya Galef. And the forum is available on the Hammer website as a video podcast as well. You should have all received some note cards and pencils on your way in. Those are for you to write your questions on for the Q&A period. And when we get closer to Q&A, we'll send around ushers to collect your cards and bring them up to the stage. And if you didn't get a note card or you need some extras, you can just raise your hand and the usher will bring you them. And please be sure to write your questions very clearly so that our moderator can read them. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Our moderator today is Miroslava Chavez Garcia. She's a professor in the Department of History at UC Santa Barbara and holds affiliate status in the departments of Chicana and Chicano Studies and Feminist Studies. She's the author of the 2004 book, Negotiating Conquest, Gender and Power in, San in California, 1770s to 1880s, and the 2013 book, States of Delinquency, Race and Science in the Making of California's Juvenile Justice System. Her current book manuscript, Migrant Longing, Letter Writing Across the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands is a history of migration, courtship, and identity in the 1960s and 70s. Simultaneously, she's co-authoring A Chicana and Chicano History of the United States with Professor Lorena Oropesa. Virginia Espino is a lecturer of Chicanx and working class history at UCLA and serves on the board of the California Latinas for Reproductive Justice, the Southwest Oral History, and, oh, sorry, and the Southwest Oral History Association. She earned her undergraduate degree from UC Santa Cruz and her PhD from Arizona State University, where her research focused on population control politics and reproductive injustice during the 1970s. Her essays have been published in the Chicano Studies Journal, Atzlan, and you can find her collection of oral history interviews at UCLA's Center for Oral History Research, where she spent six years documenting the Chicana and Chicano community of Los Angeles. Espino was a producer and the lead historian for Nomás Bebés, which was largely based on her dissertation research. Elena Gutierrez is an associate professor in gender and women's studies and in Latin American and Latino studies at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Dr. Gutierrez earned her PhD in sociology from the University of Michigan in 1999 and is a scholar of reproductive justice, Latinx studies, and feminist activism. Her publications include the 2005 book, Undivided Rights, Women of Color Organized for Reproductive Justice, and the 2008 book, Fertile Matters, The Politics of Mexican Origin Women's Reproduction, which documents the involuntary 
involuntary sterilization of Mexican origin women in Los Angeles in the 1970s and illuminates the ways in which political, social, and racial anxieties inform popular ideas about their hyperfertility. She curates the Reproductive Justice virtu Virtual Library, an online research hub that connects organizers and academic scholarship. She also directs Chicana Chicago, a collaborative research project dedicated to documenting the activism, leadership, and contributions of Mexican Oregon or origin women to the city and its Latinx communities. Dr. Gutierrez has served on the boards of and worked as a consultant with the National Latina Health Organization, Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Health Collective, the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health, Access Women's Health Justice, the Chicago Abortion Fund, the Illinois Coalition for Adolescent Health, Mujeres Latinas en Acción, and California Latinas for Reproductive Justice, and was also a consultant for the documentary No Mas Bebes. Laura Jimenez has worked with women of color organizations across the country on issues of reproductive justice, including the National Latina Health Organization, the Dominican Women's Development Center, and Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Justice Co Collective. Her work focuses on issues of immigration, environmental justice, and birthing and parenting as they intersect with reproductive justice. She holds degrees in ethnic studies from both UC San Diego and San Francisco University. So now please join me in welcoming Miroslava Chavez Garcia, Virginia Espino, Elena Gart Gutierrez, and Laura Jimenez. Hello, everybody. Welcome again. My name is Miroslava. I want to thank everybody here tonight, and especially want to thank the Hammer Museum and Claudia Bestor, the Director of Public Programs, for inviting us here, especially for all the efforts, of course, that they made this happen tonight. And um, again, um, look, thank you for coming and looking forward to our discussion tonight. Today, we're going to be talking about the historical roots and contemporary manifestations of eugenics policies and practices, particularly as they affected Latinas in the United States and beyond. And we're talking today about Latinas. I'll say that Latinas, we're referring to women of Mexican, Central American, Cuban, Puerto Rican, Dominican, and South American descent. Just want to be clear on some of our terms. Eugenics ideologies first emerged in England in the late 1800s and made their way to the United States in the early 1900s and spread rather quickly among the growing professional class of doctors, scientists, social workers, professors, and child guidance advocates, among others. Eugenics as a form of science, or what we would consider today pseudoscience, was rooted in the belief of what they called better breeding among humans, that is, of the advantageous nature of selective reproduction among those considered fit, or those who were considered to be ideal human subjects, and the non-reproduction of those considered unfit, those believed to be carriers of dysgenic traits, and dysgenic traits meant essentially bad traits that you would then um, pass along to your children. Indeed, beliefs about fitness centered on physical genetic traits that were erroneously believed to be inherited directly from parent to child without taking into consideration genetic variation, environment, culture, and other factors. These ideas were put into practice in California and elsewhere in the early 1900s through the passage of sterilization laws, the first of which was passed in California in 1909 and amended three times, easing the forced sterilization of persons believed to have an inheritable disease which ranged from a number of maladies and social conditions. The result was the sterilization of 20,000 Californians, more than all of the other US states combined. Now in the United States, 60,000 persons were sterilized um, under, these, under these laws. Um, and we don't know the full range of the numbers because we don't know the, the private small clinics and so forth that carried these out. So we just know in the public. Our laws were considered here in California, were considered ideal among many others, um, by many others, excuse me, including Nazi Germans who came to California so that they could study our laws in the implementation of their program to exterminate the Jewish population. This is certainly a very sad chapter in our history and is one that we turn to today as we hear about contemporary manifestations of these beliefs as they affected a vulnerable population, Latinas in the United States. So now I'd like to welcome our first speaker, uh, Virginia Espino. Welcome.
Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to the Hammer for inviting us uh, to participate on this panel. I was here last week for the screening and it was wonderful to see a full house view uh, the film No Mas Bebes with Renee Tajima Pena uh, and the Q&A uh, was really interesting and dynamic. Um, I'd also like to thank Claudia Vester for inviting us and the organizational efforts that she launched to make this happen. It's, it's a great um, series of programming and events around an incredible exhibit. I hope people have a chance to see that exhibit. Uh, I'm going to talk today uh, for a few minutes about the Madrigal v. Killigan case, which is a lawsuit that was filed in 1975 um, by Mexican and Mexican immigrant Mexican and immigrant and Mexican American women against um, the LA County Public Hospital. On November 25th, 1975, Dolores Madrigal, Maria Carolina Hurtado, Ovita Rivera, Maria Elena Figueroa, Elena Orozco, Guadalupe Acosta, Yaurina Hernandez, Consuelo Hermosillo, Estela Benavides, Rebecca Figueroa, and Lauro Dominguez filed a civil action. Uh, with the United States District Court, Central District Court of California against various medical professionals working at the USC Los Angeles County Medical Center. Uh, this suit was also filed against the head of California Health, Welfare, Health and Welfare Agency and also against the Director of Health and the State of California. These women, 10 of these women, insisted that they were surgically sterilized without having given their free and informed consent. The 11th plaintiff, Laura Dominguez, narrowly escaped an unwanted sterilization, but for the efforts of Dr. Bernard Rosenfeld, who was a whistleblower and also uh, an intern at the hospital. He intervened on her behalf. Um, and it's important to note that when the case reached trial in 1978, Laura Dominguez was not part of that class. So it became 10 plaintiffs um, in the final lawsuit in 1978. The plaintiffs in Madrigal v. Killigan argue that the sterilizations occurred under federal and state programs implemented in 1970 under President Nixon's family planning initiative. These new programs both assisted and promoted sterilization of, quote unquote, the medically um, indigent and individuals who were recipients of welfare. The lawyers for the plaintiffs argued that their constitutional right to procreate was violated, as well as their constitutional to do constitutional right to due process of law um, inherent in the First, um, Fourteenth, and Ninth Amendments. Dr. Rosenfeld was a whistleblower during this time, and he witnessed and documented forced sterilization uh, of laboring women, women in labor, not women who are working, but lab women in labor at the U.S. County Medical Center uh, in the 1970s. And his documentation uh, led to this groundbreaking lawsuit, Madrigal v. Killigan. As a medical student, resident, and intern working in various public hospitals throughout the United States, he came to learn that race and class, race and class prejudice, informed the doctor's practice versus the actual needs of the patient. Before the case was filed in 1975, Dr. Rosenfeld published a report titled, A Study on Sterilization, Past, Present Abuses, and Proposed Regulations. Um, this outlined his research into the question of for, forced and coercive sterilization in the 1970s. He understood the problem to be widespread because it was not uncommon for medical professionals receiving federal funds for family planning to approach women during the time of labor about permanent birth control, such as uh, permanent sterilization. The report argued that patients were not given full, a full explanation of the benefits and risks of the procedure, therefore not really fully understanding what they were giving consent for. The question of informed and Voluntary consent served as a bedrock for the Madrigal v. Killigan lawsuit. Lawyers for the plaintiffs asked, can a laboring woman who speaks little to no English give her full and informed consent about a non-emergency but life-changing cha surgery? Should a woman be asked at the time of a complicated delivery about, sur about sterilization surgery? And when is it appropriate for medical professionals to talk to women about permanent birth control? Finally, how much time do we offer women to make this kind of life-changing decision? 
No two circumstances are alike among the 11 women who made up the initial filing um, of the Madrigal v. Killigan lawsuit. Dolores Madrigal was in her 30s, and she was delivering her second child when she received this unwanted procedure. Maria Carolina Hurtado was also in her 30s, but she was delivering her fifth child when she was sterilized. Finally, Consuelo Hermosillo was only 24 and delivering her third child when she um, received this unwanted sterilization. All three women desired more children. While Mrs. Madrigal, Mrs. Hurtado, while Mrs. Madrigal and Mrs. Hurtado did not speak English, Mrs. Hermosillo was fully bilingual at the time of her procedure. So the argument that some of them did not speak English kind of falls through the waistline when you have one of the plaintiffs who actually did understand everything that was being told to her, and she does not remember um, signing these consent forms. The one thing that they have in common is not desiring tubal ligation. Upon entering the USC Los Angeles County General Medical Center um, for the delivery of their children. The mothers joined the lawsuit at the behest of civil rights attorneys. They did not intend to sue the hospital on their own. In several cases, uh, they lived with their story and their private pain. They also uh, refused to share this information with their spouses or close family members. Dr. Bernard Rosenfeld was, was the initial impetus for the lawsuit. He dedicated personal time and resources to finding attorneys to make a legal channel, challenge. Some of his contemporaries recall his efforts as relentless. He first approached Charles Navarrete when Navarrete was on staff for the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, but Maldev did not want to take this lawsuit. So Charles Navarrete, when he took a position for the um, Los Angeles Center for Law and Justice, he approached their legal team about filing a class action suit. At that time, uh, two lawyers, Antonia Hernandez and Georgina Torres Grisk, were lawyers uh, for the Center for Law and Poverty, and they decided that it would be an important lawsuit uh, to take on. Like um, Charles Navarrete, uh, Antonia Hernandez and Georgina Torres Risk had their ear to the Chicano um, civil rights movement that was exploding around them at that time. Uh, and they also had a heart for social justice causes. On several levels, this was the kind of case they went to law school to, uh, to try, to bring to trial. This case, this case spoke to many of the inequities they themselves experienced growing up Chicano and Chicana in the United States. In their mind, it was an open and shut case of patient abuse. They had documented evidence, whistleblower testimony, and time on their side, meaning statute limitations, so they could actually find women who could um, participate in this legal suit. But they were missing one important element, and that is the plaintiffs. In order to build their case, they had to find the mothers willing to come forward to tell their story. Dr. Rosenfeld collected names, addresses, dates of procedures, um, and other important information um, at the, when he was working at the LA County Hospital. He showed this documentation to the attorneys, and they uh, fanned out throughout Los Angeles in search of these women. Um, but, they, but finding the right women for the case was a really important aspect of this trial because um, at that time, understanding Mexican motherhood was complicated. You know, this was a time when Mexican motherhood was, was undervalued or devalued. And this was a time when we had scholars and anthropologists like Oscar Lewis um, penning um, research that looked at the Mexican family as a one that comes from a culture of poverty. The plaintiffs needed to, be, to perform uh, in, a, in a way that would be uh, attractive to a white jury. They had to model white middle class values. They needed to be exceptional in their lifestyle, have legal documentation to be in the United States, and not to be uh, recipients of public assistance. Similar to what we expect of our dreamers today, Latinas and Latinos needed to meet certain criteria of exceptionalism uh, in order to, for the court system to see their humanity. Lawyers understood that walking in the door of a 1970s courtroom, it meant that preconceived notions of Mexican mothers would enter first. How am I doing on time? I'm not sure. Okay. 
Um, after contacting hundreds of women, uh, the legal team for the Center of Law and Justice found 10 women willing to participate. It took trust and, pos and the possibility that justice might be served for the mothers to come out from the shadows and speak publicly about uh, their abuse, even when their husbands did not approve. It was a brave decision on their part, and one several recount was made in an effort to prevent future abuses. Jovita Rivera, in particular, wanted the world to see her humanity. She felt that what happened to her illustrated um, that doctors and hospital staff did not view her womanhood in the same way they might view their white spouses or their white sisters. Would the doctors allow what happened to her happen to uh, allow that to happen to their own family members? That was a question that she lives with to this day. Unwanted sterilizations and ensuing lawsuits, and the ensuing lawsuits received widespread media attention like no other story impacting the Chicana and Chicano community at the time. But it is a story that remained largely part of a niche history uh, within Chicano and Chicano studies until the film No Mas Bebes screened on PBS in, I think, 2016, if I'm, I'm, if I'm correct. The film chronicles the Madrigal v. Killigan lawsuit and brings some of the Madrigal plaintiffs and defendant doctors in front of the camera for the very first time. So I'm going to stop here and um, give you time to ingest uh, a trailer from the film for those of you who might ha not have seen it. Uh, it's a film that was directed by Rene Tajima Pena, and I serve as the co-producer. So if we could roll the trailer, and uh, thank you for your patience. Acá tenían camas todavía, mira. Y yo por dentro sí siento mucho tristeza. Pues Recordar el, lo que eh, siente. ¿Y por qué explica? sientes tristeza volver? Pues, ¿sabes? Mira, Pero tengo cita. tristeza. Sí. This baby boy became a citizen one minute ago. His mother does not have immigration papers. We're told they should be sterilized to save taxpayers' welfare. Something drastic must be done about population growth. The doctor walked in and said, we cut your tubes, and I said, why? He goes, well, you signed for it. I said, me? I go, I don't remember nothing. And I didn't tell my family. I didn't tell anybody. They were extremely fearful being told that you need an emergency cesarean section and you can feel blood pouring down your leg. At that time, signing the consent for tubal ligation. This is the emergency department of Los Angeles County, USC Medical Center. Some of them signed right in the midst of labor. Some of them don't even remember signing. Here I is, this young lawyer, and for the first time telling him, do you know? You've been sterilized. We are suing HEW for non compliance or non enforcement, non monitoring of the uh, sterilization regulation. It was just the beginning of the emergence of the civil rights movement in the Latino community. We were talking about abortion rights, all of the issues of feminism at that time. The idea that somebody could be forcibly sterilized, like seem like something out of a mental institution out of the 1920s. It's a claim that we're part of a greater goal of sterilizing the Mexican population that immigrates to Los Angeles. I mean, I'm offended by that. That's not what we did. The way I felt when I was young, it doesn't change the way I feel in my heart now that I'm older, but it, it's there all the time. It's like when you bury somebody, you're always going to carry it on your head.
And next we have Dr. Lena Gutierrez. Hi, everybody. Um, could I just have a show of hands of who has seen the film? Just curious if any, oh, good, awesome. So we should, we should be able to talk uh, more about the film during the q and I do encourage all of you who haven't seen it to check it out if you can. It's an extremely powerful film. And as you see, the women's voices um, uh, are quite compelling. Um, and it really tells the story of the whole case. Um, I do want to begin by also thanking the Hammer Museum for offering this program, which I think is very timely. And although we've focused mostly on the history of sterilization abuse, I think uh, I and Laura Jimenez will be talking a little bit more about um, similar kinds of uh, things that are going on contemporarily. Um, I do want to give my gratitude to all of those who put this event together and especially helped me get here at the last minute. I appreciate all your uh, patience and effort. I want to thank Miroslava for encouraging my involvement um, and my other fellow panelists for not only being here today and in this space, but for also doing this important work for so many years and in so many different spaces. Um, it's truly an honor and a joy to sit among you. Um, for those of you in the audience, you should know, um, we've all pretty much known each other for about 25 years when we were started working on um, issues of reproductive justice, either in grad school or as activists. And so um, this is especially, I think, joyous occasion, even though it's a hard topic. Um, and I also want to acknowledge and thank you all for being here. I think uh, especially on a sunny summer, uh, nice, it's not summer, but nice day in Los Angeles, it's hard to make a choice to come and have these conversations. And I really want to acknowledge your commitment and thank you for caring about the issues and hope that you will spread the word. Um, let's see, so um, I have worked and researched the case of Madrigal v. Quilligan and reproductive justice in Latino communities for a number of years. Um, and I guess what I'm here to do is to tell you a little bit more about other circumstances of sterilization abuse and reproductive oppression that have happened in Latino communities and also um, among other women of color. And I think um, although this is just you know a simple sentence, it's sufficient to say that uh, reproductive control and reproductive oppression has really been existent for indigenous women and women of color, especially Latinas in the United States since p the period of uh, colonization. So when we talk about the case of Madrigal v. Quill again, it's important to understand that it's part of a much longer conversation of reproductive oppression of certain groups of women, usually women of color or poor white women, who by virtue of their class position, sexual behavior, or ethnic identity are deemed socially unfit to reproduce and parent. This has happened in multiple ways in different time periods, depending on political interest. For example, if we take the case of African Americans, the reproductive demands of slave women were encouraged to increase labor needs, but are now targeted today as drug dependent or welfare queens who have too many children and their reproductive reproduction is discouraged. So you can see how right political context really impacts how we think about the reproduction of certain groups of women. Um, and to continue today, I'll just provide you a few examples of some um, uh, sterilization abuse incidents that have happened for Latina populations in the US. I first want to acknowledge the work of Alex Stern, who was uh, supposed to be your original speaker today, and whose shoes I stand, um, who has done some very groundbreaking work uh, with her research team at the University of Michigan um, to document discriminatory, excuse me, discriminatory sterilization practices in Southern California in the earliest 20th century. So this was something that we had known about, that there were eugenic sterilizations happening in the 30s and 40s um, within certain institutions, but had been unable to really prove. And she was able to get into the state archives and really document um, how this occurred using the logic, right, that the feeble-minded um, or the poor should not reproduce. Um, and I think Miroslava talked about this a little bit, so I won't belabor the point. Um, but what I do want to mention is that um, in the work with her, that she and Natalie Lira have done, um, they found a discernible racial bias in the state sterilization and eugenics programs. Their research, uh, based on a subset of 15,000 sterilization orders, suggests that Spanish surname patients, predominantly of Mexican origin, were sterilized at rates ranging from 20 to 30 percent 
from 1922 to 1952, far surpassing the proportion of the general population. So course of sterilization of Latino populations happened much earlier than uh, we might think. Um, another important example to mention is the case of Puerto Rico. Um, like other forms of birth control testing, such as the birth control pill, the sponge, and the IUD, sterilization was first developed and practiced in Puerto Rico as a method of population control 30 years before it was made available in the United States. Um, beginning in the 1930s, the island of Puerto Rico began experiencing what was considered a high level of poverty and unemployment, and sterilization was imagined, in part by the U.S. government, as a method to decrease childbirth and encourage women to become part of the cheap labor force. The, availab uh, the availability of government funding and promotion led um, to one-third of women of childbearing age to be sterilized on the island by 1968. Um, and those numbers remain uh, on the island of Puerto Rico and also for uh, Puerto Ricans who live in New York to this day with one-third of the population being sterilized um, by the age of 26, excuse me. Puerto Rican women in the city and New Jersey were also targeted for sterilization abuse during the 1970s and other parts of the East Coast, along with Dominican women, African American women, um, poor white women in the South, etc. When the when the procedure first became available in the United States uh, in 1969, and it's important to note that when the procedure became available, it was also fully funded by um, through federal funding at the same time when other uh, birth control um, techniques were not. Um, if you're interested to see more, hear more about the case of Puerto Ricans, this is documented in a film called La Operación, and this one is actually available on YouTube. Um, and I also recommend the work of Iris Lopez, who's the, done the work of documenting um, the patterns of sterilization abuse in Puerto Rico for a period. Um, so one more recent example that some of you might be more familiar with uh, were the sterilizations of at least 148 female prisoners in two California institutions um, who were sterilized between 2006 and 2010, and this was in the uh, California prison system. And I argue that this is another example of the state's long history of reproductive injustice and ongoing legacy of eugenics. The abuse took place in violation of state and federal laws and was started disregard for patient autonomy. Federal courts have recognized by a combination of inhumane practices such as overcrowding, um, bureaucracy, and medical neglect, um, these conditions should be um, not tolerated any longer. The second point that I'd like to make about Madrigal v. Culligan moving off the history of sterilization abuse is that this was indeed um, also a watershed period for the organizing of Latinas um, in relationship to reproductive justice. And I think Lara might talk about this a little bit more, so I won't say too much. But I think what's really important is that um, you know, might, some of you might be familiar, have the idea, right, or others might have the idea that Latinas aren't actually very interested in issues of reproductive politics or reproductive justice or reproductive rights. Um, you know, based on the assumption that they're, you know, largely Catholic, that they like to have large families, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so part of what uh, Nomas Bebes does in the, this episode of sterilization abuse is show how Latinas actually were very active, right, in talking about reproductive issues. They just had a different perspective on them. For them, it was much more about the fight for the right to have children, right, because they were being sterilized rather than the right to abortion. Um, and then the last point that I want to make, and this kind of uh, leads towards what you know you all can do today um, in terms of sterilization abuse and how it might still exist, um, is to think about um, how we continue to talk about Latina and specifically Mexican origin women's reproduction. <coughs> um, so I'm just going to read this last little piece for you. Okay. So um, basically what I explore in Fertile Matters um, is that the way in which political, social, and racial anxieties shape the construction of, of the problem of Mexican origin women's fertility and reproduction informs population policies and it also informs individual behavior. 
Um, as it's becoming more and more clear to the public, much of right politics is influenced by some of these racialized ideas. And I'm just going to provide one example for you uh, today. Um, in November of 2011, the New American Heritage Dictionary introduced its fourth edition, announcing the uh, addition of over 10,000 new words and phrases, one of which was the term, quote unquote, anchor baby. Any of you heard of this term before, anchor baby? Okay, it refers to a child born to a non-US non citizen within the borders of the United States. Um, and the, the definition was actually read aloud on a radio interview by the Dic Dictionary's executive F editor, Eric Kleinender, um, in, when it first came out. And this broadcast caught the attention of activists who basically claimed that the dictionary um, was creating an institution in this term that was, quote, poisonous and derogatory in nature. It demeans both parent and child, unquote. Stressing the political nature of the term anchor babies within the current political debates around immigration policy, she pointed out that those of us who use it are not in the business of clinically describing some sort of sociological phenomena. They are instead intent on suggesting that people come to this country illegally and deliberately have babies in order to use the children's citizenship to acquire legal status of their own. Um, now, I won't go into the details, but basically there was uh, a lot of public debate. There was a petition that was passed, and individuals were asking the dictionary to remove it uh, from, you know, including it, or at least mark it as a term that was indicated that it would be a slur, that it was a racialized slur. And ultimately, the editors did change uh, the term indicating it was a slur, although they felt like it could be, um, it didn't necessarily have to be that way. They basically gave in to public outcry. Um, what is important here is that in 2010, Time Magazine listed anchor babies as one of the top 10 buzzwords of the year. That the term quickly spread despite research that demonstrates that it largely is based on a non-reality. Um, and legal critique and critical discourse demonstrate that the term is entrenched in our culture despite the factual non-existence of the concept. It doesn't do justice to understanding how the idea of an anchor baby might right, have implications for the reproductive experiences of Mexican origin women in hospitals to this day. And I think that's part of what Madrigal v. Quilligan also shows us in the case of sterilization abuse, is, right, is that if you have these ideas about Mexicans coming over during that period to have too many children and they are overpopulating doctors come to believe that they might be doing something right to benefit their patients or the general population when in fact it's informed by um, a racist logic. Thank you. And now the Executive Director of California Latinas for Reproductive Justice, Laura. Jimenez. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Elena. <laughs> um, thank you for inviting me to be here today to talk about our work, to talk about reproductive justice, and um, to talk about sterilization abuse or sterilization then and now. Um, I'm the executive director at California Latinas for Reproductive Justice, and our work really is about um, upholding the, the dignity of Latinas and Latinx persons um, through honoring our, our experiences, our families, our dignity, our, our bodies. Um, and we work to build Latina power and, and grow Latina and Latinx um, leadership in the state of California around issues of reproductive justice. Um, so I have been, as Elena and Virginia, I think both mentioned, I have had the privilege to be a part of um, many screenings that have happened um, with the film Namas Bebes in and around California. And um, it has been really helpful for our work. It's been um, a tremendous gift for us to have these the stories of these women um, and their experiences and their families 
um, especially in the context that they, they were placed in the context of their own lives and we were shown pieces of those lives and I really appreciated that approach to the story because I think we often get a, a historical reading of, of, of this of these incidences, right? Um, which is important, but I think placing them in the context of their own lives is also very, very important. And for us, it's been a gift because it has allowed us to talk about reproductive justice with larger audiences and explain what that exactly means. Um, so I, I would like to share that with you today. I, I'm not sure how familiar those of you, uh, those of you that are here um, are with reproductive justice and sort of the context that reproductive justice as a movement comes out of. Um, about 20, 20 years ago, I guess we're looking at 20 years that reproductive justice, a little over 20 years that reproductive justice as a as a as a term came about. Um, but it really developed um, out of a history of women of color doing work in reproductive health and rights in sort of a mainstream feminist women's movement over time. And their experiences of um, tokenization, but also not having our lives and our families and communities centered and sort of the intersectional nature of, of our lives and our existences being a part of the, the growth and development of that movement. Um, and I had the, the great fortune and privilege to work with, uh, or to learn from and to have mentors who were part of these this movement or this these kinds of things that happened in the 60s and 70s, and they could recount to me sort of um, how challenging it was to be in that movement at that time. And, um, and I think that there was, I think, as Elena was saying, there's an assumption about us as Latinas, there's an assumption about us as women of color, not being very interested or not pushing very hard, uh, specifically around the, um, the pro-choice movement. Um, and the women of color that I've worked with, you know, have talked at length about the, the indigenous women and women of color who have been, actually been involved in these, in these movements and spent a lot of time saying, yes, we, we firmly believe in the right to uh, abortion on demand, right, for whoever wants or needs it. Uh, but we also need it to be connected to the context of our lives, which has to do with um, the history and the legacy of reproductive oppression in this country. Um, that we have lived for over 500 years. It has to be connected to colonialism. It has to be connected to capitalism. It has to be connected to um, lots of different um, ab abuses and um, strangling situations that our communities are in um, day to day, and from the past to the, to the present. And so this reproductive justice movement, this term, the framework was created by women of color who needed to, we needed to tell our stories and we needed the, uh, our needs to be recognized in a, in a significant way. So uh, the framework was created that was um, to distinguish reproductive health, reproductive rights and reproductive justice. Reproductive health, so this will be the very quick non-lecture version of this, <laughs> of this, um, Reproductive health is a, is a framework that talks really about services. So it's about the clinics and the medical health services that are provided around reproductive health issues. So our, our clinics, our Planned Parenthood services fall in, into that framework. Reproductive rights is really about the, the legal issues that come up around reproductive health services and access to those services. And so when we see NARAL and Planned Parenthood and um, these organizations um, who are advocates around abortion rights or rights to contraception or ac and access, right? Because rights is one thing, right? Correct? Rights is one thing, which means that the law says we have access to this and access, actual access is a different thing, which means that even though we may have the legal right to something, the circumstances of our lives, our geography, our language, our race ha affects whether or not we can actually access that right. Um, so reproductive rights is about that legal part. And reproductive justice really tries to bring those things together and connect them to other social justice movements and issues. Uh, and so it's important for us, and, and I can in a few minutes talk about some examples of what this looks like, um, but it's important for us to connect to movements such as the immigrant rights movement, to look at issues of environmental racism and poverty um, and incarceration. Uh, 
And the reproductive justice movement was founded fundamentally. Fundamentally is based on an opposition to what we call reproductive oppression and in opposition to population control um, rhetoric and, and tactics. Right, and and I think this is where it's um we it's very important for us to examine carefully things we're being told, things that Elena was talking about just a minute ago, the ways that the media portrays um, immigrant reproduction or teen parents, right, or teen pregnancy. It's very important to talk about those issues as we talk about reproductive justice, um, and so the the quick. Three, three principles of reproductive justice are about the right to not have children, which is what you probably hear the most about when we talk about legal issues around access to contraception, access to, access to abortion services, and comprehensive sexuality education in, in our children's schools. Um, we also believe it's important to have the right to have children, um, and that is based on our understanding as indigenous women and women of color of our own histories and the understanding that we did not always have the choice to have our children um, or we were forced to have children at certain times. The, this, the case um, chronicled in No Mas Bebes talks about the, the struggle of, of Latina, of Mexican origin women who were sterilized. And so we this right has been taken away from us. And so it's important for us to always look at the ways in which we are being told we can or cannot have children and to fight for the right equally to have those children. Um, and then the third is the right to parent our children, which, which is connects us to environmental issues, again, immigrate, immigration law and, and regulations, incarceration, those things. And, um, and it's where, that's where we most sort of distinguish ourselves from what's traditionally known as reproductive health and rights issues. Um, so what does that look like today? And so um, Elena spoke a little bit about the the case around inmates being sterilized in, in California prisons. And um, there were ag advocates that did work in 2014 and were able to have a bill signed by the governor to uh, prohibit sterilizations um, from happening in the prisons, correct? Because in a in a situation where there is a such a power dynamic, that there is going there's, it's almost certain that there will be abuse right around reproduction and sterilization in that in that population. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, why why are we why why is this okay, right? Why have we not heard about this? And I think we need to go back to those, um, that those histories and those ideologies around eugenics, around population control, and who is seen as fit to reproduce and who is not seen as fit to reproduce. Um, I think also one very, very recent case that is important for us to look at is the Jane Doe case that happened in Texas. If you have heard about this in the last few, last week, I guess, um, there was a 17-year-old in immigration detention who wished to get an abortion and was denied that right by the federal government, although I believe the federal government states that people in federal custody should be allowed to have, should be able, allowed to access abortions, um, but they denied her that right. Um, and there was a lot of activism very quickly, a lot of advocacy on her behalf, and um, it went back and forth in the courts, and she was able to um, get an abortion late this week. Um, but the fact that we're, yes, yeah, <laughs> but the fact that we're, um, the, this attempt was made, and of course it's on sort of that, that person at the, the intersection of um, undocumented person, young person, brown person, female person, um, it's important for us to look at who this happens to, right? Um, we also worked, um, our organization worked on the repeal of the maximum family grant in California and were able to successfully have uh, negotiate, negotiate that um, to, uh, last year. Uh, the maximum family grant really quickly was um, a rule that was instated through CalWORKS, which is California's TANF or, or welfare program. Um, and at the time of welfare reform in 1980, between 1992 and 94, um, California, along with I think 34, 37 other states, enacted um, what is called a family cap policy, which meant that if I, as a woman, were um, on was receiving aid through TANF, through CalWORKS, and I became pregnant while receiving that aid, um, there would be no increase in my aid for that additional person that I uh, was giving birth to. Um, which meant that uh, we were talking about sort of balancing the budget, um, but what we're actually talking about is ways that we can make sure that the budget gets balanced um, on the at the expense of 
poor families, families of color, um, young, young families. And so it, it's um, crucial that we look at that particular policy. And I think there's just a few states left that still have that family cap. Um, and it had very specific ex exemptions, right? So it was for um, if you were uh, reported to sp in a specific way your rape or incest, you could be exempted from that. If you were utilizing um, a specific kind of long-acting, long-term birth control, um, one of which was is no longer on the, the market anymore. Um, and so it also, in its attempt to sort of manage these dollars, also did it by um, being prescriptive around women's reproduction. Um, and also if you were sterilized, correct. So there was sterilization and long-term birth control. But other than that, if you were taking birth control pills, that didn't count. If you were using condoms, that didn't count. You know, all of those kinds of things. So it gave very little choice to people who um, wanted to continue receiving money, right, um, t t that they needed to support their families. Um, and so that was a, a really important um, and successful win for us. Um, and I think that what we need to look at going forward is um, other other current issues that are that have come up right now. I think particularly, let's talk about Puerto Rico and what's happening in Puerto Rico right now, right? So I think that that the people on that island, the island itself, is being squeezed. It has been it's a colony of the United States, and for hundreds of years, the United States has underdeveloped the um, has participated in the underdevelopment of that nation, and now that we're sort of seeing this island at the intersection of global warming, um, racism, colonial. Um, we're looking, and, and there is clearly um, not a plan for long-term aid when we know that electricity, food, water are an issue. And so the only way that we as reproductive justice can look at this is as a population control measure, whether it is stated or not. Um, it is what is, is happening there, and it's something that we have to keep our eyes on as reproductive justice advocates. I think also looking at issues of police brutality. Right. When we don't live in safe communities, whether it's violent, um, there's violence from our community members, there's violence from this institutional violence from police. We need to look at how that interferes with our ability to parent the children that we have. Um, and I think we also need to look at issues of environmental um, contamination and racism, right? And so last year we saw around this time that thousands of people um, went to South Dakota and um, occupied Standing Rock uh, around the around water rights. And these are very real issues for some of our communities, small communities, poor communities, indigenous communities, black and Latino communities that live in areas that are being contaminated because the larger, more um, affluent, whiter communities nearby do not want that pipeline to, to go in in their neighborhood because they know that if something happens, that, that it will be contaminated, there will be um, reproductive justice um, implications. Um, as I wrap here, yeah, um, uh, things that you can do, I would say, Learn more about reproductive justice. Look us up online. Um, sign on to a listserv. There, we are here in California doing statewide work. Black Women for Wellness is here locally and statewide. There are a number of national organizations that um, keep tabs on federal legislation. So sign up for those listservs. Make yourself informed. And then the second thing is when we write to the listserv, you know, and, and say we have a bill that's sitting on the governor's desk or we have a bill that's waiting to be passed by the Senate or the Assembly, we need you to make calls. We need you to make calls. We need you to make those calls because um, we will not change our situation if people who are not directly affected do not pick up the phone, pick up the pen, um, use their computer, and say, this is an important issue to me, and I won't vote for you if you don't, if you don't uh, do something about it. Um, and I think also um, it's important to question um, why we are also in favor of certain, certain things. So just a, a really quick last um, point is that when we talk about things like access to contraception um, and specific kinds of contraception, um, the reason that we are advocating for these things cannot be because a certain group needs access to that because they are too young, too poor, they don't have documents here, or they don't have the right color skin, right? Um, and that sometimes is sort of like a hidden, a hidden. Um, 
unspoken thought, I think, that comes out specifically around teen pregnancy. And we say, well, you know, there's so many teen parents, the teen pregnancy rate is, is too high, right? That's an issue because we don't support teen parents. It's not an issue because they're creating this tremendous economic burden. It's an issue because we don't support teen parents in the way that we should to achieve their educational and economic goals. So always be questioning yourself, asking, you know, why are we saying this is a good idea? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So we're going to have a, a short conversation here among ourselves just for um, a couple minutes, and then we're going to take your questions. So I'd like to ask if it's possible for the ushers to collect your questions, if you have written them, or jot them down quickly on your note cards, and please pass them to the end, and then they will be collected and be brought to me, to me too. We can address them. But I will. Um, I have several questions, but I'll just limit it to one up here to ask the panelists. Um, and, all of you spoke to this issue a little bit, but I want to hear, I think it's really good to spend a little bit more time talking about this. Is, and that is, what do these histories or these experiences that you're talking about tell us about where Latinas fit in our political and social landscape today, so or in the past? So where do Latinas fit? I mean, the political context, I think it was, um, I wrote it down, I think it was Elena who said that specifically, uh, how important that is. And so, um, yeah, so how do, where do Latinas fit today? What do you think? that? Any of you would like to answer or address this question? I, I can start. <laughs> I can start. Um, I mean, speaking spe specifically about the, the con context of California, there's seven and a half million Latinas in the state. We're about 30 something percent, right, of the female population. Um, and I think it, it's important that we not only are um, exercising our political power in different ways, in including um, making those calls and in and, and writing those emails that I shared with you, but um, and, and voting, right? But I think that also it's important for us to um, share our stories because a lot of times the, the policies, the politics that we hear about, they don't have, there's not, a, there's not a face, there's not a story next to it. And so it makes it very hard to make it tangible. And I think that's what this, this film did so well was to, um, to make that tangible for us, to make it understandable. Um, and I also think that um, it's important for us um, to, to exercise our political power because uh, we are often seen as Latinas as being quiet and sort of disaffected or not interested in, in these things, um, in reproductive health, issues of reproductive health or sexuality. And I th and seeing the, the activism and advocacy done specifically around this case tells us that that's not the case. It's not just like it just happened in the last 20 years. It's been something that has been consistent um, as we have always protected and defended our own families um, through different you know, experiences of colonization and, and um, uh, yeah, attempts to control our populations. Um, I totally agree with, with Laura. I think, um, you know, I think part of why I started writing about this case was also because a lot of the way that the history was understood that like was it was like a, oh poor look at these poor victims you know kind of story like oh these women you know they can't speak English you know they got sterilized oh poor poor women um, but what you see in the film and I'm sure some of you who have seen it can agree is that these women were really forward thinking they were willing to risk their lives right. Um, they put themselves on the line in a very, very, very racist kind of situation. Um, and quite frankly, you know, I think that, that they're badasses. Um, so I think, you know, it tells us about also a, uh, about Latina leadership and what it really looks like, right? And I think sometimes that's why we're invisible because we don't fit, right, whatever the model is of what um, activism or organizing or being on the front lines um, really is. I also think that what we see is that organizing, Latino organizing from the forefront was always very intersectional. You know what I mean? That it wasn't just about gender or race, like the Chicano movement or being a feminist. It was about, right, all of the parts of their lives included. And that led to the kind of organizing that they did and the kinds of things that they asked for that I think now inform the reproductive justice movement, yes, but that other organizational movements are looking for it as a model because it is possible, right? Whereas before we thought it was, we really had to chop up our identities and our issues. Um, so those are two things I think it adds. 
Yeah, I'll just add that um, as a historian, I'm mostly focused about what happened in the past, but I have found through my research and through the filmmaking and also the screening of this important film that people are hungry for these kinds of narratives and that they get gain strength from learning about women who were active in the 1960s and 1970s and not simply women who were important leaders like someone um, who comes to mind, Dolores Huerta comes to mind. I mean, that, those leaders are very important, but I think uh, the, the generation that's coming of age today is really looking for the everyday person. And I think what the film does is show you these everyday, ordinary women and how, they, how remarkable they are uh, and how ins exceptional they are. And so I think that's really important for, for our political activism. It's really having these stories to build the, the strong foundation underneath us and to push us forward uh, onto that next level of activism. And I think it has done that when you see someone like Gloria Molina, who started off as a Chicana activist um, around the sterilization case, later on become a prominent um, city official, uh, one of the most important Latina politicians in Los Angeles. Just collecting some of your questions here. I had one more question for the panel panelists. Um, if you could just say briefly, like in a few words, so this will be kind of difficult, I know, but um, <laughs> what do you hope to gain by telling these stories? Like, like what is your purpose? Like, we have lots of purposes, so that's the reasons why we do this work, but if you could sum that up. So we'll start here with Virginia. Well, I grew up in Los Angeles, and I grew up very close to the LA County Hospital. And I have family who use the hospital for their medical care. But I didn't learn about the sterilization of Mexican women until I was in my 30s in graduate school. And I was so outraged that this history wasn't part of our collective memory. It wasn't part of our collective story. And I mean us as Angelinos, but also as Latinos, Latinas, uh, coming of age in Los Angeles. So I made it my mission that this uh, case, Madrigal v. Killigan, would be as important to um, LA history, to US history, as other important lawsuits like Roe v. Wade or um, Brown versus Board of Education. And I think through this film, we, we actually have uh, made huge headway, headway as far as um, informing people about this lawsuit, informing people about this history, and um, hoping to prevent it from happening again. Um, I, I mean, I guess I have a very similar experience as, as uh, Virginia, I'm also from LA. Um, and so it was something I'd heard a lot about um, and was very pissed off about and wanted to get, to prove that it had happened. Um, I think what's interesting, you know, now that the film is out, it's it's kind of like, well, you know, this is an, the analysis that we have. Wow, they, you know, there was racism and there was eugenics and there was classism and these women's ex women experienced this because of these and these reasons. But when I was writing the dissertation, right? None of that had really been argued or proven or anything. It was just like we knew about this case of sterilization abuse. Activists knew about it. There was a couple articles about it and, right, but we didn't really know why it happened. That argument hadn't been made yet, right? That this was intentionally racially motivated, class-based, et cetera. Um, and the women's voices weren't there at all either. So, I mean, I really wanted to prove that this happened and it was really, really messed up um, and that it was racist and sexist and against immigrants and uh, focused on poor people all at the same time. You know, part of it was an intellectual argument saying like, you know, this, this all this stuff is mixed together. Um, and also to prove to the more general public, right, like that these things matter. Racial ideas matter. It matters when we say like, oh, look at those people. They don't have, you know, they don't use birth control or oh, they're all Catholic, right? That those ideas that we have that we just throw out in our popular conversation really actually have some institutional impact on individual people's lives. Um, and what I'm doing is I want reproductive justice for everybody. That's, that's why I do this. Um, kick ass, take names, and move forward. That's my few words. Um, <laughs> um, 
I think that it's it's just um, we do work around culture shift and policy change, and um, it's important for me that we sort of hold the line around um, making sure that issues that are of importance to our community um, get brought to the forefront. Uh, I th and I also think that um, looking at issues that we have kind of just lived with for the longest time, you know, I think looking at sort of the, the Me Too campaign or whatever the heck, it, whatever it is um, that's going around right now, it's really um, infuriating that um, we just kind of assume that this is a normal thing and we just keep moving forward and now all of a sudden people are, women are coming forward and talking about these issues and we need to do that about all of these issues. They need to be like normal stories about healthcare, abortion, contraception or whatever it is and, and, and folks need to, um, we need to you know, talk about why they're wrong and how we need to heal and be about the well-being of our communities. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. It, it, I know these are hard to sort of sum up really quickly. So we have some wonderful questions here, and I did want to, um, I think for the for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of read through them, and then we can pick them up. I think there's some interesting, I just want to get your voices in here in this conversation, so that's important. One thing I did want to read, um, a card that's, that's not a question, but I thought was a really good statement that pertains to lots of folks. So and this person says, this is not a question, but an apology. I did not know about the horrendous injustice of forced sterilization. Knowledge is power and not a cliche. I am appalled and ashamed by my ignorance. So thank you to the person who wrote that. I think it's very common to still get lots of, outside of, I think in Los Angeles there's some consciousness, but um, so it's very, lots of my teachers topic, my students are like, when did this happen? Even eugenics is very new. I mean, they're young people and they're learning. So um, nevertheless, thank you for that comment. Um, I will kind of go through three, we're not race through them, but I'll put these three out there, really, really good. Two people ask very similar questions about, what does justice look like for victims of forced sterilization? How can women obtain justice, right, if they found out today that they were sterilized? So maybe about that. And somebody asked about what, are the, what was the result of the lawsuit? So, um, and then the last one is about, how have men uh, in the Latinx community reacted to or got involved with issues of reproductive justice? So maybe we can have um, Laura, this talk about that one, you can talk about the results of lawsuits and maybe perhaps Elena talk about what does um, justice look like? Sort of. Go ahead. I'll, uh, I was trying to avoid answering the question about uh, how the lawsuit played out only because when you, if you, if this is your first time hearing about this case and you've never seen the film No Mas Bebes, it's much more um, emotional, impactful experience if you don't know how the lawsuit um, turns out, but they did lose their case and there was an appeal. Uh, they did not win the appeal either and so it's, it's a huge tragic um, outcome when you think about what does justice mean. And uh, maybe Elena can, can talk about that because these women did not experience justice when it came to the legal system. Um, one outcome from the case, though, that I will say that uh, didn't happen as a result of the trial, but part of the, um, what do they call it, legislative efforts that they made was that um, working together with folks from across the country, New York especially, um, did come up with revised informed consent forms, which were then based on a 72-hour waiting period also, so that there was a time between when a woman was asked if she wanted to be sterilized and actually uh, signed the papers and the um, consents also are supposed to be in um, at a sixth grade reading level in, the, in a patient's own language. So that's kind of seen as kind of the positive outcome of the case and those laws still exist to this day, although unfortunately, I, based upon some of my recent research, I don't think they're necessarily being um, abided by. You know, I, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer this question about justice um, because I know, I mean, this is an con ongoing conversation that we're having now and also part of, um, you know, that we've all talked about and thought about, you know, what, what does it mean for the film to be out? What do we do next? What, right, do is best uh, on behalf of the women? Um, and really, you know, who decides? And I honestly haven't asked, talked to any of the women about that question. Um, and I don't know if you have. Um, go ahead. <laughs> I could say the what I've heard is, is about what is happening, justice. but I'm not yeah. here. 
Well, I mean, what I want to say is I, there is no justice in this case, these cases. There is no justice that's going to be had by anybody who has been sterilized forcibly or coercively. Um, getting a settlement is not justice. You cannot, they cannot reproduce again. This is not something that can be reversed. So there is no justice. So let's be clear that that doesn't exist in this case. Um, we are currently working with um, a California Assembly member and, and other organizations on a, on a sterilization compensation bill um, for some of the victims of the state-sponsored sterilization programs for uh, uh, during a certain year period, which I'm not sure. And it's it's very um, new right now, so you can look for that in the next legislative session, and you can push your legislators around that, that around that issue. Um, yeah, so I, I um, yeah, <laughs> that's that's what I know right now. Um, in terms of men being involved in reproductive justice issues, it has mostly been women that have been um, working on reproductive justice issues. Although reproductive justice is not a framework that applies only to um, one gender, it applies to all gender or non-binary people, um, and so. It is something that, as women of color, we have thought about over and over again. Um, and because a lot of the issues that we deal with are specific to things that are happening to people who are men in our, our, in our community, um, and, and what that means that around incarceration rates, or around um, immigration policy, and things like that. So, um, so it is something that we would like to have more, more men be involved in. And I think that that means that we have to start and open dialogues in our communities about reproductive health, reproductive rights, and sex. Frankly, we need to be talking about these things because it, in as it concerns um, anything reproductive that generally, you know, the, the entire society just says that's a women's issue, which is why we are in the situation we're in now with the current administration who, you know, which does not think that these are important issues at all or that it's a general health care issue. Um, and I think that if you are a man with women in your family, you know that the, all of these issues will affect the, in, affect the entire family and they affect the, the entire community. Thank you. Uh, what else, there one other thing about this, the question earlier about the, is there any justice or um, uh, There are, have been efforts, many of you might know this already, in other states because California wasn't the only, it was the leading, the leader we are in lots of areas, and sadly in sterilizations, but um, there's other states as well where there was practices uh, took place. And North Carolina being one state that's been very much in the news and um, issuing reparations. So they've been giving victims, surviving victims, um, I think it was $50,000 or something like that. But the news conferences where they have the victims talking about, it, they're so powerful. You go online and you can watch them. Uh, California still hasn't quite made up its mind, I think, in what it's doing. There's been efforts by different groups and um, was involved with Alex Stern was lead, helping to lead one in which to find that we were thinking about how do we commemorate something like this or how do we make it and bring it into the public, a public commemoration. Even that was very difficult largely because there are very few survivors who've come forward. I mean, zero. We had one or two and he, one of them died. And um, so, so, you know, how do we make Californians, you know, know about this consciousness and also memor memorialize it? It's still something that needs to be worked work through. Um, I haven't been up to date on what the group I'm involved with it, but we, what has been um, lately has, has been going on. So um, is there anything else you wanted to add to any of these points? I Virginia? guess one thing, and that is justice is really determining or determinant on the person themselves. And so in the film, they're still alive. They can talk and articulate their own perspective. And while they don't see justice through the process of the filmmaking, they feel like they were, for the first time, believed. That somebody believed them, that somebody um, actually took the time to listen to their stories. And many of them lived, with, lived for 40 years with shame, that it was really their fault that these surgeries occurred. And so the process of making the film, going on screenings with us, talking to people like yourselves, um, empowered them to have a different perspective of that experience. And while they didn't experience justice, it was a bit transformative for them and empowering. Thank you. I've seen the film um, once or twice, and I'm um, watching the doctor that you that was the whistleblower. Um, 
I thought, wow, I don't know, it just hit me sort of thinking, I mean, every time you watch it, you get different things out of it, but I thought the transformative experience in his life and how he really defines, I think, I don't know, I'm just putting words in my own, his mouth and his experience, but defined him, I think, in some ways for his life work that he did. That's so powerful to have that, you know, to do something like that so great. So I was really moved by that. Um, Maybe we'll do one more um, question. And that somebody was asking is how does California compare to other regions in terms of this kind of um, history? Um, if you want to say something, somebody asked specifically to the Aborigines of Australia, we could look at other, I mean, there have been moves for sterilization throughout the globe, of course. Um, we could probably be here. <laughs> I always tell my students we could teach a whole class just about this little topic or read several books just on this one topic. but. Um, well, what I do know is that it was um, and not globally, but locally, you could see federal funds for family planning impacting communities throughout the United States, primarily working class communities in the Deep South. African Americans were impacted. American Indians were impacted, both in um, urban health centers and also on the reservation. Um, women in Appalachia were also impacted by these programs, um, coercively sterilized, and uh, women on the island in Puerto Rico and also um, on the mainland. So you have these different segments of communities being impacted by this money because the idea that certain populations were having more children than they could take care of was part of the population control narrative. Uh, so originally you have this devaluation of certain mothers, African-American mothers, Latina mothers, Puerto Rican mothers, Appalachian mothers. So there's this legacy of devaluation where these mothers don't receive the same value and rights as um, more middle class white, white mothers do. And so these population programs were targeted to these groups. And you also have these population programs being targeted to poor women in other areas, in other countries, in China. Uh, that's how you get the one um, child only law in India where you have women being paid um, to receive sterilization surgery. And so these ideas don't just um, reside in the United States. They're really funneled out into these other areas based on the notion of who's a good mother, who's a bad mother, who's a valuable citizen, and who's not. Yeah, so we just wanted to say how much it is. Um, we even have to catch ourselves, and so the, how it, it's insidious in the culture, and how we're like, even small comments here and there about, you know, who decides to have children and who's entitled to and who should be having babies and not. You hear this. Unfortunately, sometimes in your own families, and you're like, what are you saying? But it's just because that's something, the way in which our culture sort of, um, you know, what what is valued in terms of um, uh, what's the best right, fit, fitness in terms of who should be reproduced and should, who shouldn't. But clearly in this case, it was to the nth degree, right, um, the way it's played out. It wasn't just simple, simply language. It was something else more than that. So, okay. Any other parting thoughts? Very powerful. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. And these questions, were really, I'm going to keep these and share them with our uh, panelists here so that we all have your questions. So um, if you'd like to contact us, I'm sure we can get our information out there. I'm not sure um, our emails. I'm open. I shouldn't speak for them. But if you have questions, follow up. Certainly welcome to hear your voices. So. Thank and you. we'll be here. Yeah, we'll be here too. So. Thank you, everybody.